Great. I'm Jeff. This is my mom, Jean. Um, I'm visiting from Portland, as, as we heard, and uh, I've been in town a, a week um, helping out my mom. I, I retired after 32 years with uh, Oregon OSHA as a chemical safety consultant and uh, got talked into coming to help my mom. And uh, two days later, we were in the tornado together. So it's been quite the week. Um, it's been interesting. <laughs> and and uh, yeah, so, and then last night, she reminded me that I was supposed to do this presentation. So this is like high school and college for me. I, I prepared it last night. Sometimes I did well, sometimes I didn't. Um, so we're gonna start. We're gonna do a presentation regarding Fletcher's Boathouse. We, we recognize that Fletcher's Boathouse is in Washington, DC. Um, this is a, a, a story about Fletcher's Boathouse. Um, it, it's sort of a fishing tale. It's, it's going to involve some other things as well. The fishing tale of those that got away, but we're going to talk about those that didn't get away and the men that caught them and how it all happened. Welcome to the boathouse. Um, Fletcher's boathouse is located on the CNO Canal. Um, maybe some of the people there have traveled down CNO Canal and see the old white building that's uh, the Abner Cloud building. And uh, the signature red boats that, that were for Fletcher's Boathouse. They're the red canoes with the gray lining and if you saw gray markings on them, if you saw them, you knew that they had rented them from Fletcher's. They rented boats there from before the Civil War until about two or three years ago. They've been, it fam, was family owned and always family operated except for some of my family that worked there over the summer. It was a wonderful place to teach your children how to fish it was a wonderful place to picnic. It was halfway between Georgetown and Sibley Hospital, and you never knew you were in downtown Washington. Fletcher's Boathouse um, has been operated by the was operated by the same uh, family for six generations. The uh, the, the signature uh, Fletcher is Julius Fletcher, who in our lifetime he would have been my grandfather's age when I was a young child. Um, his sons. Uh, Joe and Ray ran the boathouse for most of my memory. I do remember the old man as, as he was called um, when I was young, but for the most part, I interacted with, with Joe and Ray and my brother worked there many years and many friends were employed there and, and, and learned how to fish at Fletcher's Boathouse. So and for many young men learned how to carry boats from the canal to the river and back. It was a huge, hard job, but they worked them all summer long and they paid well. Most of the paintings that I'm showing today are from my father. Um, in preparing for this, I asked my, my father to present this and he wouldn't do it, but he did volunteer to take me fishing yesterday um, and, uh, and then told some stories. So he's, he's in love with this place and these are his paintings. Um, this is the horse-drawn passenger barge and the John Mule train on, on the canal. For many years, you could go up to Fletcher's and you'd see the, the horse, the mule drawn barge, it went up the canal and it went to the lock just past Fletcher's and would turn around. But lots of people from Georgetown would ride it, particularly on a Saturday afternoon or evening. Quite often they had big parties on the boat and they would stop at Fletcher's and get off. There usually was a bathroom around there. And, People really seem to enjoy it. At the same time, people would be riding bikes up and down the canal. The, uh, the train on the right is the John Mule train. And this is a train that, that ran mainly between, I believe, Washington and Philadelphia in the 1800s. It's one of the first uh, steam engine passenger lines that operated on the East Coast. Um, they also had a line that ran from Georgetown to uh, Carter Barron and uh, Great Falls on the Maryland side. Uh, so that, that train ran for quite a while and it was dismantled and that, the, the original train was in the Smithsonian for many, many years. You, you can still go see it in the Smithsonian. In, a, in a 1981, the Smithsonian sponsored a uh, uh, demonstration of the original steam engine and installed a special set of tracks from Georgetown to Fletcher's Boathouse. Um, for a hundred year celebration of the steam engine. And that, that was uh, quite the event for many, many people from Washington of importance uh, came out to participate at Fletcher's. There were always people at Fletcher's day or night. You didn't have lighting down there. And what you had to do is you drove halfway and you could pull in 
where the Fletcher sign is, which is just across. And then you had crossed, you were on the river side. If you pulled in, there was only parking up at the top at that point. And the McLeod house was there. That was also a flower place at one time, a flower grinding place, not flowers. Yeah, the, the, the Cloud building was his, his home. And, and they uh, had a mill down the canal and they sold what was called everyday flour, which was uh, the most popular flour in, in the DC area at that time. Um, for, a, I, for a very long time, the only way across was you had to take the drive down in there and you could either go through the aqueduct, which was kind of scary because it dripped. It was a rain it. culvert. It was a rain culvert and an aqueduct and only certain people would they let park on the river side of the of Fletcher's. We've always had private parking there, but the other people parked in the upper lot and then were rode across, well, pulled across on a rowboat to Fletcher's itself so that they could enjoy the, the canal and the bike riding and all the different activities that were there. So, so the area that we're talking about from, from a fishing perspective is between Chambridge and Key Bridge. On the left-hand side, a picture of Chambridge during the Civil War. Chambridge was built at, uh, to, to move materials for the Civil War, but also to protect DC. The, the Confederates were on the other side of the river or very close. I know they definitely got as close as Manassas because I've been to that park, but you can see the, uh, the guard shack on top of that protecting Chambridge. The original bridge is gone as we know, but yesterday my father was pointing out that you can still see these big metal rings down at the base of the bridge, these three foot metal rings that were used to secure it and some of the original foundations still there as well. On the right hand side is the beginning of Key Bridge in early construction. Um, my great grandfather helped build Key Bridge and actually died in 1923 um, and, and, and fell from the uh, bridge as, as a mason um, building chain bridge. Um, that left my father's, uh, my grandfather in uh, Georgetown on P Street, I think, or yeah. And uh, he uh, got attached to walking up the canal. He said by about seven years old, he would just go walking up the canal and meet all the boathouse people. But the one at the end, Fletcher's, he became best friends with uh, both Joe and, and Ray. And, and the became, old man. And the old man. He said he was more like a father to him than anybody. But he uh, used to, even as a young boy, he would be up there fishing and he'd bring back buckets of row, mostly herring row, and would sell it. I didn't know any of that till recently, but I knew he walked up there all the time. It's always been a beautiful, serene spot and lots of people have always visited. What used to amaze me is you'd be standing at Fletcher's Cove and it was named for them. And you could hardly believe that here the planes from National Airport would be going over you, that you were right downtown, but it didn't seem like that at all. It was gorgeous down there. There was always picnicking and everything. So yesterday I left at about 7 a.m. to go up the river and it's been a 2007 was the last time my dad let me on his boat because I blew my knee getting on his boat. And he said I was never allowed again. But uh, yesterday, <laughs> he, he took me for the first time. Um, and uh, sorry about that. I thought I turned that off. How do I go back to my screen? Can you see it? Mm -mm. See you. One second here. Sorry. And uh, there you go. Yeah, I blew my knee. Um, and went fishing that day. That, that was an expensive fishing trip for me. Um, but I'd forgotten how beautiful it is with the sun coming up and you're in the city. Um, and then you, you pass Georgetown and almost immediately, Georgetown University, you're almost immediately in, in, in this serene place. I, I'd forgotten how serene it is. And uh, I think I learned that there. This is Fletcher's Cove, once about three quarters of the way from uh, Keybridge to Chambridge on the right hand side going upriver is Fletcher's Cove or the Cove originally. And it's just a large inlet where they were able to uh, build a dock and they were protected from the currents. You can see on the right hand side, the point sticking out and there's a point on the left hand side if you've ever been down there. So it was a protected cove for boating. Um, the the uh, cove was uh, a valuable fishing ground it was also used um, for transportation. On the Virginia side, in the Overlook area, Virginia Overlook are all the farms. I'm sure many of you or some of you live here have been to the Overlook and know that the farms are, the farmhouses are still there as part of the tour. That the, was all truck farming. They truck, they, Fletcher's came over across and would barge the 
fruit and vegetables back and then take it down to Georgetown. But that's all what that was. Yeah, so directly from. across from Fletcher's is what was called Dixie Landing on the Virginia side. And they always maintained a strong relationship with the farmers on the Virginia <laughs> side. Is there a question? No. All right. Uh, um, the cove, the cove was a uh, very, very good it, it, in its day. Um, prior to Hurricane right. Agnes, the cove was probably um, one of the best places to catch crappie. Or my mom says crappie. I informed her it's crop, it's it's crappie unless it's the old people talking at the shed, and then it's crappie. <laughs> but um, on the left is, you know, my father was saying that that was the size of the crappie he caught when he was was younger, till the till they had environmental problems. And on the right side are uh, the multiple bluegills. When you learn to start fishing as a kid, you mostly catch bluegills. Um, and then they'd catch minnows from the dock, which they would sell for bass fishing. Um, I'm sure if my friend Colleen's listening, remember many days that we would leave from the Cherrydale 7-Eleven to walk the Windy Run to go fishing every day. I guess if we were actually fishing. But um, we would fish uh, that bluegill heaven right across from Fletcher's Boathouse, which was always very successful. This is the, the Fletcher Shack as you see it today. Um, when it started, it was basically the left-hand building. The second building was added on the right when they started renting bicycles and bicycles were there. Um, this was a place for uh, bait, boats, bikes, bites, and a lot of uh, BS. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Oh, when, when my kids were little and we'd go down there fishing a lot, I seldom went, but Paul took them frequently. They had to wait on the dock for their dad to come down. They were not allowed to stand up there and listen to the talk around the, the boathouse itself because it apparently was pretty raunchy, but they stayed down there. But they learned to fish very early. They started off with cane pole fishing and usually we had an extra fish on the line. So they always caught something when they went fishing. It was a big treat. In this picture on the left-hand side is Joe Fletcher's uh, grandfather and grandmother operating the rope tow barge across the canal. Um, this was the only uh, existing photograph of, of that generation of Fletcher's um, from the early 1900s. Um, the rope tow was, is, is still in place today. Well, no, the bridge has been built now. The rope tow was taken out at one point after the, uh, the canal flooded because of Hurricane Agnes. They never built it back, and now they build a footbridge over. So this is a, a non-existing commodity for, for people who go to the boathouse. If you don't know them, you're walking across the bridge. If you know them, you drive through the culvert and park. On the right-hand side is a picture of Julius Fletcher in the middle, the old man, and on the right hand side is my father and his, uh, he was 17 years old and his high school friend, Mike, and they're holding a, a, a stringer of white perch. And that was, that was the reason a lot of people came to Fletcher's Boathouse is, is the white perch was a subsistence man's fishing uh, expedition that they could go out and catch many of them um, and, and help feed their families. And so, you know, even, even as a teenager, um, they were required to, to go get fish. My father said it, more than half the money went to support his family. He never got the money and he had to pay for his own clothes with the money he's had. Um, so the, the, the photo that I actually changed um, is he was wearing khakis and a, in a, in a khaki coat. And I said, dad, you're wearing pretty much the same thing today. And he goes, yeah, I never really changed my style since then. <laughs> um, so maybe he has a lot less hair. Um, this is a photo of, and this is from an article in the Washington Post in 1979. Some people like to do it standing up. This is the, it's a stand up rowing. That is not, not other okay. things. It's up to you. The stand, the stand up rowers, they stood in the center of the boat and balanced themselves. They learned how to do that from an Italian gentleman. Charlie Maggio. Charlie Maggio. Originally, they, they called him Big Slim and he could row these boats standing up, it's a straight up position with just a forward push, push, push. They could row down to Chain Bridge. They could row down to the Key Bridge and come back. And it's quite a ways. And those are about 700 pound boats. But it was interesting to watch some of them. All of them have been written up in the Washington Post in different articles from time to time. But the remaining, I don't think there's anyone left that can stand up and do it. But I think two or three of the original 15 are still living. But 
it was always exciting to watch some people go out and point. Look at that, look at that, look at that. But, so, so Charlie Maggio was from Italy and he told these young men that he was going to teach them to grow like, grow like, grow like gondoliers and that it was much more efficient than the way that they learned that they wouldn't hurt their shoulders and backs. Um, and uh, yeah, there's, I, I know my father would like to be able to do this now. <laughs> I'd like to be able to do it, but I could. <laughs> is a very interesting so the first the first runs of, of of fish in the potomac river are the white perch and the white perch come up in uh in early spring um in uh in, in in either late march you know the second third week of march the perch are some of the largest i don't know if you have ever seen a perch but what this gentleman's holding on the left is about a two pound perch um it's and this big. Was, this was caught fairly recently. This was just a couple of years ago. So they, they have still very, there was, there's five to six schools of shad that come up the Potomac each year to, to spawn in the Potomac River, um, spawn their eggs. And then the, the, the minnows and things that you're catching there for fish bait are, are the shad as well. Um, there was also at the same, a little bit, a few weeks later are two types of shad, the hickory shad pictured here and the American white shad, um, these would come up in very large schools. And the shad was the primary uh, target fish that you wanted to get to be able to catch rockfish, which was the, the desired uh, sport fishing or ex exciting fishing for the Potomac River, um, you needed shad. They, they, they're, they're in spawning. They do not want to hit lures. They're not interested in worms. They're really not interested in much. But if you can put a herring out in front of their face, they're going to bite it. The herring and the and 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 the uh, the sh the the uh, shad and the perch, pretty much the families in in the full area that would fish, they would salt them um, for year-round use. Um, so I'm sure many of you have had uh, salted herring. Um, I think I've tasted it once, and that might have been enough for me. <laughs> <laughs> Um, we did have herring. Rub. The Holloman's next door made, made it one time from dad's herring. And I was like, no way. Um, on the right hand side is, is a herring row, um, which was a subsistence food um, from the fishermen there. Um, and uh, as, as my mom said, my father would sell it for five dollars a quart, he said, when, when he was a kid. Um, we were, as kids, we were always informed that it was a delicacy and that we had to eat it. When, when I was really young, I made the mistake that my mom gave us an option of one food that we weren't allowed to eat. And I said I wouldn't eat peas. And then my sister was born and she was the smarter one because she said she wouldn't eat the herring roe. <laughs> uh, it would take about three bottles of ketchup to eat, <laughs> eat dinner that night. We were always told it tasted like French fries. So we thought if we put enough ketchup on it, it would taste like French fries. <laughs> It did not. But it was, it was a, a it, it is considered a delicacy. It's, it's good. Some people like it. The shad were used uh, for planking shad is the most historical thing. George Washington had a large business of uh, planking shad to sell shad. So they still reenact shad play, planking. Uh, the, the Park Service does it at, at Fletcher's Boathouse, I think every year, but they haven't done it since COVID. But they usually do a shad dem uh, flanking demonstration. I don't know if you see it. So they build a big fire in the middle of, the, of a smoking shed. And then you see these wooden planks on the right and left turned backwards. They, on the right, picture on the right didn't come out right, but you could see the tails. They would, they would uh, fillet out the, the shad and open them up. And then the smoking and the, the hickory planks would give them a, a good flavor. It'd be like a smoked fish. Um, and there's a, George Washington has many, many comments about the, uh, Delicacy. Delicacy and planking of shad as, as a business opportunity. This is a picture from the 1950s, family, friends, fireworks, and fun. On 4th of July, the Fletchers always gave a huge everything free party. And it was a big family event. All people would come early and spend the entire day there. They had free hot dogs, burgers. You could bring whatever you want. If you wanted to share, you could, but you weren't required to. But you were there all afternoon and they set off fireworks at night and it was quite the display. It was very friendly and everyone had a good time. And I spent many 4th of Julys down there when the kids were small. We had a good time. Yeah, I, I think um, 
if I wasn't at Windy Run fishing because my father was a DC firefighter and he, he would be working days or, or painting. Um, if I wasn't at Fletcher's Boathouse fishing, I was probably at Windy Run, at least that's what I'm looking gonna, across. That's what I'm gonna tell my mom at this point, at least. <laughs> <laughs> but um, it's it, amazing what it's I a, didn't know. <laughs> it's a beautiful river down there. But I, I remember many times my brother and family, and, and you can see all the cars in the parking lot. This became a, a real center point. I mean, this is sort of what was interesting to me is that no matter what economic or social situation you were in, you were all friends at Fletcher's Boathouse. Um, to the fact that, that, that Joe Fletcher was the private tour guide for Teddy Kennedy and his family, so they would go rock fishing. Um, and many other senators and congressmen would be there, who, whoever. <laughs> My older son, who's only a year and a half older than Jeff, worked at Fletcher's from the time he was in high school till he graduated from college. He worked the food concession and moved many boats, but I can remember he loved it. He was there all the time because he could ride his bike there. Later, he had a car, but I can remember one summer he got really annoyed. Everyone would come up to the food concession and say, what's the cheapest thing here? And finally, Mike got tired of it and he had a couple of shirts made and the shirt said, the cheapest thing here is you. He did get in trouble for that. <laughs> and this is just a picture from the 1930s of, of the canal. The swimming in the canal was very popular, but they, they wound up outlawing it and we weren't allowed to swim in the canal. We would go there when the canal would freeze and skate ice skate but that that was really the canal was more for just a pleasure walking and bike riding at that point for me as it still is as it still is um this is a picture of uh julius fletcher in the middle and the chief of police um you know sort of district. the people for the district of columbia and we see it says dip nets are legal um gill netting was done on the potomac river for quite a long time even even though you know only native americans were pretty much allowed to practice it um, but uh, gill netting began. Um, the last time I remember in 2007 going out with my dad, um, there was a large green pail with rocks in it and we're going up the river and he says, um, if you see this type of boat, throw that in the river. And I'm like, why, what is it? He's like, it's the gill net. I said, I thought we were running it. He goes, well, I got this letter and it said if they caught me with it, it was $5,000 or six months in jail. I decided that uh, I don't wanna do the six months so we'll get rid of it. Um, but you needed the herring to uh, catch the rockfish, and that was the, the, the goal that they would catch the uh, run the gill nets with Joe Fletcher once a week and get five to six hundred herring in, in one cast. Um, and that's what they, they would sell for fishing, and they would sell them for 50 cents a piece to the fishermen. The one other connection for me is in Great Falls um, in the Jackson family. My, my my father's relative, Captain Jack Jackson, uh, moved from England to the Great Falls area um, prior to the Revolutionary War. His son um, fought with George Washington, but they owned all the land around Great Falls towards McLean as well. And then uh, his grandson lost most of the property through bad business deals. And then uh, in the 30s, during the Depression, the county took over the land for a dollar an acre from them. And if you go to the park, there's still the Jackson family still um, as part of the national park. But what happened was during Hurricane Agnes, um, when, when Great Falls was destroyed the, and the, the carousel, my family ran the carousel there for, for ever, <laughs> 1930 till 1972, um, that affected Fletcher's boathouse. And I, you know, there was a tie up to all the people along the river, but. But the Park Service started intervening more and they closed that they closed the concessions and everything there and they wanted to do it at Fletcher's, but they had a family living there and, and didn't want to throw them out. Um, this slide is teach a man to fish and my mom says he will never be home. Um, <laughs> I didn't know that how it went, but but I thought it was something else. But uh, this is a picture of my me and my brother Michael Michael Jackson I grew up with him, um, just in case you didn't know. But uh, you learn to fish with cane poles at first and we would fish for bluegills and then you move up to spinners. And if you could cast a spinning rod and catch a bass, then you were allowed to go fish, really fish in the boats. And the first thing you catch is a catfish. And on the left is a pretty good sized catfish, but these catfish could range, the average ones are 10 pounds and you could catch them up to 50, 60 pounds, right out That's right in the way. river. And this is the picture on the right is, is me yesterday. I caught a 12 pound catfish and I, I see in that that my father is much more braver than me because he would pick it up and I didn't want to touch the thing. I was scared as hell. 
Um, Yesterday so, you were scared to say Yeah, I didn't want to touch it. So it's, it's in that net somewhere. Uh, but this is what we were fishing for. This is, uh, this is rockfish and this is my father, the fishing guru and with a Fletcher boat and they would, he would troll uh, the herring down the river, a whole herring on a big hook and then you'd pick up rockfish. And this is, this is an average size one. This is the size of rockfish that would stay in the river um, all year long. And, you can, and we saw them jumping yesterday, but they wanted nothing to do with us. This is getting to be a good size rockfish. This is a 30 pound <laughs> rockfish. And these are rockfish that uh, we, we, we would catch five to eight a day when we went fishing and bring home maybe one that we would bake. It's about it. We baked it. We had we had crab meat stuffing for it, or we had a bread stuffing, and we gave away a lot of rockfish that yeah, we I, just couldn't possibly eat at all. My father still gives away all of his fish. He says he gets much more from giving away than what he would get if he ate it. The other fish that are pretty popular fishing there is smallmouth bass on the left, and they run all up and down the river. And now uh, walleye have been reintroduced to the river as well. <laughs> In 1972, Hurricane Agnes hit um, and, and really impacted the river. Um, it took out the canal and it took out the cove. As you can see in this picture, the, the cove is filled in. Those boats are displaced. Um, what had happened was when they built the CNO canal for a sewer interconnect from Maryland down to Blue Plains Wastewater Treatment Plant, all of the fill they deposited up, up above Fletcher's <laughs> boathouse. Well, that was a low lying area. And, uh, the cove never really got flushed out correctly after they did that and it started filling them with silt. So when Hurricane Agnes came, it just devastated the area. Um, and, and there was difficulty removing it because now this was 72, the Environmental Protection Agency was uh, about a year and a half old and uh, they wouldn't allow it to be dredged because of the PCB and heavy metal contamination and they didn't know what to do with the soil. So it just from 1972 on, it became difficult to operate the boathouse because the park service did not want them to dredge the, the, the cove. Today, we're back to a beautiful canal. I do, I do remember one story from uh, when we were on the canal when I was a kid, when it blew, I was down there with my father and I, I was walking with my friend, I think it was Colleen's brother, Tommy. And, and uh, we came running back, we saw pterodactyls, we saw pterodactyls. And my father goes up there and says, no, those are called blue herons. So, um, <laughs> was, I, do, I do remember that. But today they, they rent, they're renting. And, and this is what's changed the dynamic. When, when I was a kid, it was $5 a day to rent a, to rent a boat. With Julius, if you offered him $2 a day, he would take it because he said that's $2 more than I would have at the end of the day if I didn't rent it. So today I looked it up, a kayak, $72 a day, a canoe, $112 a day, a rowboat, $112 a day, a bicycle, $44 a day. This has changed the dynamic of who goes to Fletcher's Boathouse. It's no longer the diversity that it was, but the nature is there. It's a beautiful place. It's serene, it's quiet, it's lovely. Everyone is always welcome. And this is right before COVID, the fish are still there. These are rockfish. <laughs> trophy rockfish that they're catching on the river. They're not allowed to, to fish during spawning season anymore um, to try to maintain the, the, the fishery, um, but you are allowed to keep one, one rockfish over 21 inches and, and it cannot be an identifiable spawning female. Um, and uh, very diverse populations of people fish there now. And as you can see, they're still catching pretty large catfish in that bottom right one there. <laughs> 